study with stanzas here from this hymn. But we'll use it as our opening here. <clears throat> 594, God's own child, I gladly say it, so let us pray. Oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, the hymn writer reminds us, God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. He, because I could not pay it, gave my full redemption price. Do I need earth's treasures many? I have one worth more than any. That brought me salvation free, lasting to eternity. O oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for that great blessing as you have baptized us into your Son. And now through him and in him, we have life, salvation, and forgiveness. May we grow into that every day as we ask your blessing upon our study this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As I said before, turn here to page 1345, or to page 16 here in the little pamphlet. We're going to look here at finishing up Luther's meaning to the third part of baptism. How can the waters of baptism do such great things? We're finishing up the last sentence of Luther's meaning. But with the Word of God, it is a baptism. That is, and here's what we're going to focus on. It's a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. It's a life-giving water, which means it's a water of salvation. That leads us here to today's big topic, which is where if we had a Baptist here, they would just kind of go wild. From the standpoint of saying that baptism saves you. How can baptism be a life-giving water? How? Because remember, to be saved, you've got to be brought from death to, to life. And the Holy Spirit, as we talked about in the third article, the Lord and giver of life. So, we're going to look at does baptism save you? So we need to turn to 1 Peter 3. So turn to 1 Peter 3. That's where we're going to begin here today. 1 Peter 3. And we'll start here in verse 18. As you're turning there to page 1296. In fairness, if a Baptist was here, or kind of a big box, non-denominational church member, they'd say, hey, baptism doesn't save you. Their answer would be what? Jesus saves you. Jesus saves you. And you're saved how? By faith. Now, we looked at last week, baptism gives you faith. Gives you life, salvation, forgiveness of sins, as we went through the catechism last year. Uh, last week gives you the gift of faith. But Jesus saves you, but it begs the question do you have to get to Jesus? It goes back to this, this model. Do you have to get to Jesus? Or is Jesus going to get to you? That's the thing. Do you have to get to him, or is he going to get to you? How are you going to get to him? Or if he's going to get to you, how does he get to you? Let's look here at 1 Peter 3, starting at verse 18. Here's where the Baptist would say, right on, brother, preach it. Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. They'd say, see, you're saved by Christ. <laughs> Keep reading. It's true. But what does it say? That he might... What does it say there? Bring us to God. Which model? Do we go to God or does God bring us to Him? God brings us to Him. He comes down to us. We don't go to God. He comes to us. He's got to get us to God. How does He do that? Yes, salvation is achieved at the cross, but how does He give you the benefits of that salvation? And here's where you have two divergences as well in Christianity. 
Because it's kind of as I talked about today in our announcements at the end of first service, so often in Christianity, we see salvation and its components as concepts or ideas or philosophies or things that God gives us. He gives us life. He gives us salvation. He gives us forgiveness, which is true. But where do we find those things? We find them in Jesus, which is why He doesn't send you a book or an email or a teacher. He gives you Himself. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. There's the answer to our Gospel reading here today. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If a man eats of me, he has eternal life. Not if a man understands my concepts, my philosophies, my principles. That's, that's the world re religions that are out there. Like Buddhism. Follow the Eightfold Enlightened Path. And then you'll work your way up the path to God by doing these eight enlightened things. You know, God comes down and He gives us a person. Now, how do we get this person? How do we receive this person? And in the person, you get those things. Life, salvation, and forgiveness. But you have to have a person. You have to have a person. And He does it all for you. He suffers once for your sins. He's the righteous one for the unrighteous. That He might bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the Spirit. In which He went and proclaimed the spirits in prison. This is the descent into hell that we talked about. He doesn't go down there to give people a second chance. Alright, He goes down there to proclaim the victory. I win, you lose. They're down there because they did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. They had 120 years while Noah was building the ark. As the writer of the Hebrews says, God, God sent Noah to build the ark. Yes, but he was the great preacher of righteousness. How many converts does he get outside of his family? <laughs> Nobody. He's a great preacher. Nobody shows up and packs the pews. The people that are working don't even come to repentance. Because don't believe he built that big boat all by his lonesome. He hired people. He was preaching to them. They didn't come to faith. They're like, don't need it. Ain't gonna rain. You're an idiot. I'll take your money, but I ain't gonna believe. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, here it is, verse 21. This is the big one. This is what's in the rite of baptism that you hear as we start the baptismal rite in our hymnal. Baptism now saves you. So if somebody asks you, does baptism save you? That was the question that was given to me. We were going to it this week anyway, but it's a great question. You know, I've got several different questions. You know, do you have to be baptized again? No. And we'll talk about, that was another question, well then, if you're saved through baptism, why do people fall away? We're getting to that. Alright? And then can you be saved without baptism? That was another question. We're going to tackle them all here today. But does baptism save you? Look at verse 21. Baptism, comma, which corresponds to this, now saves you. So this is where, you know, some grammar, this is good. Take out the that which corresponds to this. We'll go back to what that means here in a moment. But that's a modifier. Shorten the sentence up. What is it? Baptism now saves you. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't say that anymore. Yes, it does. Right here. Right, it's right here. Right in our Bible. Baptism now saves you. Baptism which corresponds to this. What is this that's modifying? It's going back to the ark. God provided it. What Noah's idea? Gee, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the advanced, uh, you know, uh, NOA, you know, National Oceanic and Atmospheric, you know, Commission here. Tell me what the next hundred years looks like. Ooh, there's going to be some global warming here, climate change. I should build a gigantic boat. I should be ready. Now we can come up with it. God told him. Gave him the specifications. God provided the salvation. The ark is a picture of the, of the church. Because notice too, when you read Genesis, 
God, it's, it's a beautiful verse that most of us don't pick up in the flood account. God put Noah and his family in the ark. And then God, yes, surely, God shut the door. And then God sealed it. He put them in there, saved them, and safely sealed the door. He had he brought in AM waterproofing. God sealed it up. Alright? And it was ready to rock and roll. God saved Noah and his family from beginning to end. Peter says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. How does it save you? Not because you're going to take a shower and you're getting rid of the dirt and the stench of the day, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. If the old King James, in the new King James, puts it kind of in paraphrasing, presents you to God with a clean conscience. And I did some word study on this this week. It's kind of a difficult Greek word there. But it's the whole idea is it doesn't remove the stuff on the outside. It what? Cleans the inside. It's from the inside out. It's what we sing in David's great repentance song. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51. Wash me. Cleanse me. So that I can be clean again. You know, people will, will come and tell me after they've committed you know, some horrible sins will come to me and say, Pastor, you know, I, I went in and I took a shower, 17 showers in one day, trying to get clean from my sin. But it doesn't, it doesn't work. Water doesn't, doesn't clean you in the, can't clean the soul, can't clean the what? The conscience. Only God can do that. That's, that's the great gift of baptism. Now, how does it do it? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll get that in part 4 of baptism from Romans 6. We're baptized into the death and the resurrection of Christ. You're baptized into Christ so that you die with Him and you rise to new life with Him. If you don't do anything, He does it. And he's gone into heaven, he's at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers. Even the de demonic realm now are all subjected to it. There's so much here that we talk about for a long time. But from the idea now, as the scriptures say, after the resurrection, Satan is thrown down. Can't go back in like you see with Job. Can't go back into heaven and say, hey, you're going to let that dirty, rotten scoundrel Almighty in the kingdom of heaven? Don't you know what he's done? Here it is. Whammo! You can't let that clown in. There's no way. What has is, what is Jesus done? Cast him out. He's done. He can't come back in. Why? Because all the sins are, as we read at the start of this, Christ suffered also for sins once for all, as Paul says. Here, it's Christ also suffered once for sin. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. You're connected, as we're going to read in part four here of baptism in a moment, that we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, or that Christ has been raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We too might rise to newness of life. That's Romans 6, because we're baptized into Christ as we, as we pray here at the opening. God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. He, because I could not pay it, gave my full redemption price. Do I need or as treasures many? I have one worth more than many. That brought me salvation free. Does baptism save you? Yes. That's what the hymn writer says. That brought me salvation free. And it lasts all the way to eternity. Baptism saves you. As the, as the King James says, it gives the answer of a good conscience. You're not clean. You're forgiven. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. It's better than tide. You know, it gets, it gets all the stains out. That's what baptism does. Because it connects us to Christ, which is what we'll get to. Now, here's the interesting thing we have to move on to for the sake of time. If baptism saves you, how come everybody who's baptized isn't saved. 
All you have to do is look at church rolls. And we've got 400 and I don't know what it is now. 400 and some baptized members. What do we get here on an average? Now some of them are moving away, their grandchildren, and you know, have maybe transferred their membership and are going to church and so forth. But let's just let's just take even round numbers. 400 baptized members. How many are here on average on a Sunday morning? 125. All right. So that means there's 275 that are here. Now we're going to tackle that in this little. Going to be a little bit of maybe a controversial thing here, but it kind of connects with some stuff we have coming up here. Um, can you be saved without baptism? The interesting thing is, can you be saved without going to church? Does and I'm going to tackle that in the sermon series. What does it mean to follow Jesus in your everyday life? It's going to be one of the things we're going to tackle. Can you be a Christian and say, I don't need to go to church? Christians don't. Hmm. Does does the New Testament ever have a Christian that's there and doesn't go to church? No. I mean, pretty short sermon, amen, we go home. But, you know, we kind of flesh that out a little bit as we look at the third commandment and so forth. But we need to tackle here today for just a quick moment. If baptism saves you, how come everybody who's baptized isn't going to be in heaven? See, that's what the Baptist, if he was here, in all fairness, that's what he'd say. What do you mean? It doesn't save you. Because all these little kids that you baptize, a lot of them, don't go to church and don't believe anymore. So how can you say baptism saves you? You're a liar. I've been told that. So now, what do you say in response to that? How can baptism save you if all the kids who are baptized, and even all the adults who are baptized, aren't going to make it to heaven. What do you say? Kurt? Well, it's kind of like being adopted. I mean, you can be adopted to a family and then when you get to a survey, you can say, I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. Were you in the family prior? Yes. Yes, you were given the name. Were you, so, when, when you were baptized, were you saved? Yes. yes. It's kind of like what we talked about last week. We're at that individual... Who was, who was in my office over and over and over again many years ago. We were talking about baptism. I was going to marry him. And the girl was a member of my congregation. But he just was going through adult confirmation. He got to baptism. The dude just kind of said, this no, is never going to work. <laughs> I don't believe baptism saves you. I don't believe infants should be baptized. Because we talked about last week. They don't sin and they can't have faith. And we, and we walked through that. People asked whatever happened. They did get married. They, uh, he did not become a Lutheran. She left the Lutheran church and now is going to kind of a big box church. Yeah. So, but he struggled with this whole thing. And also one of the things he struggled with is how can baptism save you if everybody who is baptized isn't going to make it into, into heaven? Now, as we looked at last week, as he talked about, well, faith, there's a provisional faith. Kind of a starter faith. No. There's only one Lord. What do we hear today again? One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God, and Father, and Son. There's not a starter faith that doesn't save. As we read last week in, in Matthew 18, that a millstone should be tied around, you know, the neck of a person who leads one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. And, and he said, well, that's a provisional faith. Well, remember, it's the Greek word pistuo, the same word that's used in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave us one once and whoever believes in it, who has faith, and shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a saving faith. It's saving faith there is a saving faith in Matthew. But can people have faith and fall away? Yes. yes, look at the parable of the sower. Look at the parable of the sower. Look at Judas. You know, people can have faith. What does the scripture say? Take heed lest you fall. You know, you can be tempted and fall away. So can you have faith? If you have faith, it has to be, as we talked about last week, a saving faith. So if you have faith, it's not a starter faith that gets you to heaven. No, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. It's all faith says. 
Baptism saves. But see, for a Baptist to understand, you have to get into their mind. They see salvation is, it means I have to be in heaven. Otherwise, I'm not saved. But I can be saved at a point in time and then lose my salvation. Because as Kurt says, I can be in the family and then say, you know what, sayonara, I'm out. I was in the family, but now I, I don't want it. Or you're given the Christmas gift, literally. You have it for a while, and then like Heather and I, my family have this past week, we took some of the things that we received at Christmas, put them on a table, and put them out in our driveway, in our garage, and we got, we got rid of them in a garage sale. You can take this great Christmas gift and say, you know what, it was great, I used it for a while, but I don't really like it anymore. It don't fit, it don't work, I don't want it. You had it, but now you're putting it out, and like I saw at the garage sale, five dollars, no. Three dollars, no. One dollar, now we're talking. Now somebody will take it. And then you gotta get, you gotta get rid of it. And it's gone. That's what people do with their faith. If I had it, I don't want it, doesn't work for me, and now I'm going to get it and I'm gonna do it on my, I'm gonna do it the Frank Sinatra way. I'm going to do it my way. Yes, so is that where free will comes in where we can then reject? We don't have free will to choose. We have free will Remember, we have the only will we have is to say no. As Luther says in his great book, our will is back until Christ comes and sets us free. And then we've been set free, and then we can be, it's, it's a great illustration. My kids know I like Andy Griffith. My parents raised me on Andy Griffith. So... <laughs> You know, I had to watch it as a kid all the time. I remember we all sat around and watched it. All the reruns on TBS and everything else as a kid. And we had cable. But at WGN. But, um, you know, it's kind of like Otis Campbell. You're free, but you can go and what? Walk into the jail and lock yourself back up. God is coming. He's set you free. Like Barney says, but, hey, the inspectors are coming, Otis. Get out of jail, man. We got to clean this place up. You're set free. Then what does Otis go and do? Goes and gets his party, we call him Snoopful, comes back, and as the inspectors were there, he all under himself and locks himself up in the jail again. We can do that. That's all we can do. I can't set myself free, but I can say, you know what? I can be like Otis and say, I want to go back to it and lock myself back up again. So isn't this one of the reasons God gives us adversity? Because that's what turns us around quite often. Yeah, no, that's why He gives us trials, tribulations. Because of adversity. Right. Because, you know, we always think that's the problem with the American Christian church today, that God's coming to give us blessings. And sometimes when we have blessings, we go on autopilot and we forget God. Sometimes, like you see in the Old Testament over and over and over again, God has to take His people and take them out of the wilderness. And that's why John the Baptist shows up. He doesn't build a honky mega church in downtown Jerusalem with a big gigantic sign. He says, I gotta get you away from all this stuff. And I gotta get you out here where I can bring you to your knees, where you've got nothing to trust in other than me. Also, I struggle with the fact that attendance at church is the the paradigm we use to judge whether someone has faith. Right. Um, you know, sometimes there are circumstances that Correct. there's not a church that's that's suitable or, you know, and so I don't know. I, I struggle with that one. No, it is. it is. It is a tough one, but, you know, it's kind of the interesting thing that can I be saved without baptism, which we'll get to here in a moment. Yes. But if you have the opportunity to be baptized in the Holy Spirit's presence, the Holy Spirit will what prompt you to be to be baptized. If you sit here and say, hey, I'm 75 years old, I've been a Christian for 65 years since I made a profession or whatever at 10 years old and walked up to the altar and gave my heart to Jesus. I've been a Christian for 65 years, but I don't need to go to church. And I don't need to be baptized. Can I say they're not a Christian? No. 
But do the red lights go off? Yeah. Because if the Holy Spirit is present, it's kind of like I said last week with Philip and the Ethiopian unit. There's water. What prevents me from being baptized? I'm going to want to do it now. The Holy Spirit is going to prompt you to be baptized. The Holy Spirit is going to prompt you to go to church. Why? Because I've got to find the person of Jesus. Is Jesus present with me at home? Is He present with me out on the golf course? Is He present with me when I'm driving the car when I sleep at night? Yes. But is He there to give me Himself in a special way with His gifts? No. Except through the power of His Word. But the, the Word and the sacraments that He gives to the church. See, that's where I think we have to understand that Jesus didn't come to create. I think in America today, we kind of have this Jesus came to give me because it's I, I just need a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's just Jesus and me walking. And it's just between me and Him. And that's not really anything that we find in Scriptures. Jesus didn't come so that He could create a personal relationship between me and Him. He came to create His bride, which is the church. And He saves His bride. You know, think of that great hymn, The Church is One Foundation. With His own bloody water, and for her life He died. And this is the church in 1 Peter 3, in the ark. That's the church. That's, he's saving the church. He's coming to save His bride. That's what, that's what Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. I'm not talking about a husband and wife. I'm talking about the relationship between Christ and His bride, the church about how he loved her and gave his life up for her. That's where the hymn writer gets that wonderful imagery from. It's from Ephesians 5. Now, as I was saying in the sermon, can we say, okay, this person isn't going to heaven? No. But does it cause me to take heed and be a little concerned? Absolutely. And, and here's another thing to be concerned about. Just because you're in church every Sunday doesn't mean you're going to be saved either. So it's not like you sit here, I'm here to you know, punch the, punch the uh, uh, attendance card, and now I'm in. And then I'm sitting there and i got my phone out and I'm paying my bills and putting my bets in for the Sunday afternoon NFL game. And you know, I'm on draft king and getting taken care of everything. You know, i got important things to do here today. Because this money line on that... Uh, you know, Arizona Cardinals game, man, to live, and that's ridiculous. They're going to get blown out. So, you know, I, and I can sit here and I can do whatever I want. It's not just punching a ticket. That doesn't get me in either. What, what saves? Faith in Christ. And then I'm connected to Christ. Where do I go to get connected? That's the big thing. Well, what I want to tackle very quickly is, if infants are saved through baptism, why do some fall away? I want to read something here that I pulled out of the commentary. It says this. Some people say that as a problem with infant baptism, this is the fact. Here's the problem. Why do some people who are baptized fall away if baptism saves? Underlying this objection is a certain sense of once saved, always saved. In other words, if one is saved in one's infant baptism, or baptism in general, the person should be guaranteed to go to heaven when he or she dies. Once one becomes a Christian, the kingdom of heaven is supposedly guaranteed. However, Scripture takes issue with this idea. The Bible teaches that true believers can and often do fall away from the faith. Here's Matthew 13, parable of the sower. Jesus says, As for all was sown on the rocky ground, this is he who bears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. Now, he does endure. He does have faith. If he has faith, we're building on last week. There is only one faith. We heard it today, too, in Ephesians 4. That faith saved. He endures for a while. But, here's the problem. Sometimes tribulation, it's meant to push us to Christ, but sometimes it can push us away. Because it's kind of the make or break point. I'm going to use that in this sermon series when we look at Revelation with our Lord's letters to the churches. And He talks about, hey, don't be lukewarm. Don't, you know, don't be lukewarm. Be hot. I'd rather be hot or cold. 
But sometimes when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, I'd rather save my life. And he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world, the delight of the riches, choke it out and it proves unfaithful. 1 Corinthians 10. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You can't fall away unless you were standing firm and had faith. Then we've got 2 Peter 2. If they escape the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the problems are true. A dog returned to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to the wallow in the mud. There's just in this commentary three sections of scripture where it says somebody has failed and they what? Fell away. Baptism saves but you can fall away. Because remember baptism is not magic. While an infant is saved in baptism, he or she can still fall away from the grace given in baptism. Infants must later be taught the meaning of their baptisms for their lives. They have to learn, as we're going to talk about here probably next week, to grow in their baptism, which we're going to talk about in this sermon series. We're constantly growing into who we already are. And the old adage is, if you're not growing, then you're what? You're dead or you're losing it. It's the old adage. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. And that's, that's what we have to do. Because remember, go back to the Great Commission that we started in the first part of baptism. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice Jesus doesn't say, okay, to be a disciple, just be baptized. And it ends there. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always in that which is why God gives us the preaching office. Alright? A pastor. The Word of God. So we can continue to grow. You don't go to grandma's for Thanksgiving dinner and eat and say, okay, grandma, I'll be back again next year and uh, I'm not eating until then. It's such a wonderful meal. Or, you know what, grandma, it was great. I'll be back especially with the price of food right now. I'll be back. I'm not going to eat anything. I'll be back in 12 years. And I'll eat again. I'll come back. For, next, that 12 years, I'll come back for Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> All right? I'll be there for both of them. And then if things really rock and roll, I'll be there for the Easter ham. All right? No, you can't go a year, 12 years, without what? Word of God. Without eating because you will, you will die. So... Yes, we're saved and we're brought into the kingdom of God, but you need to continue to grow in that, in that faith. In that faith. And that's, that's the importance of it. And that's why God gives us, as we're going to see, not only baptism, but He gives us the, the Lord's Supper. And the point five sacrament, confession and absolution, that we'll tackle next, sandwiched in between baptism and the Lord's Supper. Notice it just doesn't end with baptism. No, it, there's also the Lord's Supper and there's confession and absolution. Yes, Ed. Just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. <clears throat> have you heard of anybody who said that don't need baptism because the disciples are not baptized? No, but again, how do we know they were well, baptized? Paul was baptized. Um, many of our Lord's disciples were the uh, disciples of John the Baptist. And, uh, and, and I would say just because it's not recorded doesn't mean they weren't baptized. <coughs> they were running around being baptized. I mean, baptized enough, so I'm sure they were baptized along the way. These are their words. Yeah, these are their words. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, Peter preaches, I would say that would include him as well. Yeah. Yeah, but no, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question, too. All right, now, the next question I was given is, 
Can you be saved without baptism? Turn to 2 Samuel 12. Let's go to the Old Testament. Now you're going to say there was no baptism back here. But I think, as we talked about last week, the Old Testament counterpart of baptism is what? Circumcision. That was around. Let's look at 2 Samuel 12, starting the verse 15. 2 Samuel 12, verse 15. This is now after David's sin with Bathsheba. For those of you who maybe don't know, King David has a little uh, tryst with another man's wife, basically kills that man, takes the wife during his little affair. Um, King David gets Bathsheba pregnant. Then finally, David thought he covered the whole thing up, was going to get away with it. God sent the prophet Nathan in chapter 12. Has a great way of preaching to him that he's the man that's committed this incredible sin. David says, I've sinned against the Lord. And then he writes Psalm 51. Then what happens? What's the rest of the story as Paul Harvey would say? Now, before Nathan leaves, David, he says, God's not going to kill you. He's not put away your sin. You're not going to die. But nevertheless, because by this deed you mother be scorned the Lord, verse 14, the child who was born to you will die. That's always hit me pretty doggone hard. And somebody else pays for the price of King David's sin. But I'm not God. Sometimes I don't have all the answers. Talk about why there, speculate, but we won't. Nathan leaves, goes to his house. Verse 15, the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife. Notice it's very interesting that uh, it's not called David's wife, it's Uriah's wife. That Uriah's wife, even though Uriah's dead, that Uriah's wife bore to David. And it'll later say that David. After the child dies, David goes into his wife, and she conceives and gives birth to Solomon. And in verse 24, David comforted his wife. But here, Samuel reminds us, now, it wasn't really David's wife, it was Uriah's wife. The Lord afflicted the child with Uriah's wife bore to David, because when David impregnated her, she was somebody else's wife. There's why. And he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of the house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. Why is that important? The day before it was its boy, the day before he would have been circumcised and brought into the family of God. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to go and tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was alive, he spoke to him, and he didn't listen. How then could we say to him, The child was dead? He may do himself some harm. Put yourself in David's shoes. I did this. A child came from it. And because of what I did, this kid's going to die. Try carrying that burden of guilt around. Then, and for the rest of your life. That's some pretty heavy guilt to be tracing around with. Which is maybe have that in the back of your mind in Divine Service 3 when we sing, Creating me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit for me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Because right now I don't want to live. I don't want to live. Look at what I've done. And they're saying, hey, this guy's beside himself for seven days. He won't eat, won't drink, won't sleep, won't shower. He stinks, he's a mess, and he just sits there, lays down on the floor, crying and yelling and screaming and praying that God would save his son. So they say, hey, behold, while the child was yet alive, he spoke to me and listened. How then can we say to the child's dead? He may do himself some harm. Now, here's kind of some background to this. I have heard this preached at the funeral of a stillborn. Or, for a child, 
uh, that was born and died before he was baptized. Okay? Keep that in the back of your mind. So then, they're saying, hey, what's going to happen here? How are we going to break this news to him? Look at verse 19. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. David's not an idiot. Alright? He knows something's up. And David says to his servants, is the child dead? They say, yes, he's dead. Now, verse 20, get this. Now, this, if you read the Lutheran Study Bible, they say, you know, some people have said this, that, and the other thing and in their notes, and it's kind of an interesting thing. It's something that's always been kind of in controversy. But I kind of don't agree with the Lutheran Study Bible. I agree with some of the Lutheran fathers and many, many Lutheran pastors on what this verse actually means. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. What? He, he, won't, he won't shower, he won't eat, he won't sleep. All he does is wail and scream and cry and pray. Then when he dies, he gets up, showers, washes, changes his clothes, eats, and goes in to church and worships. <clears throat> Wouldn't exactly be my response. Then he goes to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said, what's up with this dude? What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child when he was alive, but now the child's dead, you get up and eat food. And here's, here's the interesting verse that's kind of in controversy, 22 and 23. David says, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows, whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not come back to me. Now, some people say, Lutheran study, the Bible kind of takes this, that David's, you know, kind of almost in a state of, hey, it's just, he's dead, he's gone, he's not coming back, and I'm going to die, just like, you know, that's where it's at. I, I'll be straight up honest with you, I, I don't think that's a very good interpretation of this. I think, I think what David is saying here. I, I, you know, he's not going to, I can't bring him back to me. He, he's not going to return to me, but I will go to, to him. I'll see him again. Now, he saved, and I think that's why God took him on the seventh day. And as so many Lutheran pastors have said, and I've read so many different things on this, why does it say on the seventh day? Who cares? Unless there's a point. And for the Old Testament Jew, the point is huge. He dies before he's brought into the covenant family. And David says, hey, because then David would be saying, I'm lost just like him. I'm going to die and it's over. But he no, no, I'll see him again. I'll see him again. Why? Because remember last week, this is why we're going to tie this all together. We read a couple of Psalms. What did David say? You made me trust in you even when I was at my mother's breast. You made me a child, even when I was in my mother's womb. So, remember, David is the one who wrote those songs. So he's saying what? You can come to faith in the Old Testament church outside of circumcision. How? As Paul says in Romans, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the, the Word of God. David is confessing, did this child, as we talked about last week, can a child have trust in faith? Yes. David is confessing, I believe that my child was given the gift of faith, brought in the kingdom of God. I, I, I'm not going to bring him back here. He's not coming to me, but I'm going to, I'm going to him. Can we be saved without baptism? Yes. yes. You can, because faith saves through the power of the word. Remember, going back to the catechism. Remember, how can water do such great things? Not just the water, it's the Word of God. And with the water that does these things. Along with faith, we trust the Word of God in the water. For without God's Word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the Word of God, it is a baptism. It is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. 
Can you be saved without baptism? Yes. But can you reject baptism and be saved? No. Can you sit here and say, I've got faith, I'm not baptized, I don't need to be baptized? No. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to reject baptism if He is present. Okay, any? We're kind of down here to the last two minutes. And then we'll get to part four next week and kind of really connect some dots, which I think is really good with connecting baptism to the person of Jesus. And I'll probably, I wanted to get to it today to keep on schedule. You know what? It might fit really well with starting this sermon series next week with identity and baptism. And that we're baptized into Christ. And I will say one thing as a preview. It's interesting, our Lutheran fathers always picture the origin of of the sacraments coming from where? The body of Christ. And you've got great Lutheran artists at, at the Reformation, after the Reformation. Jesus is on the cross. What flows from His side? Blood and water. And they've got the water flowing into the baptismal font. they got the blood coming from His side flowing into the communion chalice. It's a great picture. Because from the side of Jesus comes the woman, his bride. Let's go back. And what does Paul call Jesus? But the, the second Adam or the last Adam, who's the first Adam, the first man, from his side comes his bride, Eve. From the side of Christ comes his bride, the church. And you've got the two sacraments. It's his side is pierced. And flows flowing into the baptismal font. Beautiful paintings. Beautiful paintings. The water flowing into the baptismal font. The blood flowing into the chalice. From the side of Christ. Because, again, what's the origin of the sacraments? Jesus. I am baptized into Christ. Into Christ. And next week I'm gonna I was sent there's a great email this week from Crossway Publishers. I buy stuff from them, so I some I got on their email list. And you gotta input the stuff, you gotta put your crazy email in. And then once they get you, they jam your inbox. But I got an email this week that just blew me away about some new book. And uh, it's called Personal Union with Christ. And I'm gonna read a couple paragraphs from this email about the problems in the evangelical Christian world in the United States, that we just want to talk about concepts and ideas and things. Um, benefits, blessings, grace, forgiveness, salvation, life. And we disconnect them from the person of Jesus. And we need to get back to having a personal union with Christ. Now, nowhere does it connect to baptism in this, but it's interesting they're identifying as a problem. We've, we've disconnected all these things from Jesus. And God doesn't give us the idea of forgiveness, the idea of grace, the idea of justification, the idea of salvation. It's not a concept. It's not a principle. We, we talk about it as other things. He gives us the person. And you've got to get the person. So that's the teaser for next week. We're, you're not going to get an idea which then will show you as we go into this Bible study, where am I going to go to find the person? I can stay at home and find ideas and concepts and principles. But i got to go and find the person. Where's the person? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of it. i got to go and find the person. That's why Paul always talks about, and that's what this book talks about. We've got to start doing something with the language of Paul that I'm in Christ. This personal union that I'm, the only way I'm going to be saved is I've got to be in Jesus. I've got to be found in Christ. I've got to be clothed in Christ. I've got to die with Christ. I've got to rise with Christ. I've got to be found in Christ. This, this email was great. It identified the problem, but they don't want to get to the solution. The solution is part four of baptism next week. There's a teaser. There, yeah. I don't think they're going to come up with the answer because they're not Lutheran. They're not Lutheran. 
They're, they're Calvinist, Crossway Publishing. But they're, but they're beginning to recognize we've talked too much about ideas, concepts, principles. And, and what, what's amazing is, is there's a lot of wonderful people, and I, I run into these people, these conferences I go to, who are beginning to realize we're not really all that biblical in where we're at. Because they're reading the Bible and they're taking it seriously now. Thanks be to God. And they're beginning to come our way. They really should say they're coming biblically. It's not our way. I didn't create this way. Nor did Martin Luther. They're, 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 they're heading to understanding things in a very biblical way. And, and that's what we'll tackle here next week. Is the interesting thing that Jesus says, if you want to follow me, we're going to, we're going to do this study. We're going to follow four Sundays. Follow me means to die. How are you going to die and rise again? You can't do it. So who's going to do it to you and for you? And that'll lead us to this study, sermon study, and, and our baptism thing next week. So let's close here with a word of prayer. The time's up. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to pray here two, uh, sta uh, two stanzas here of uh, God's own child, I gladly say it. So let's pray. The Lord, the hymn writer says, Sin disturb my soul no longer. I am baptized into Christ. I have comfort even stronger. Jesus cleansing sacrifice. Should a guilty conscience seize me, since my baptism did release me, in a dear forgiving flood, sprinkling me with Jesus' blood. There is nothing worth comparing to this lifelong comfort sure. Open eyed, my grave is staring. Even there I'll sleep secure. Though my flesh awaits its rising, still my soul continues praising. I am baptized into Christ. I'm a child of paradise. Dear Lord, we give you thanks that in Christ we are new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. As we begin our sermon series next week, may we continue to learn as we look at part four of baptism next week, may we continue to learn what it means to, to die to sin every day in Christ and to rise again in life in Christ each and every day. We commend ourselves into your hands, giving thanks for that new identity, that new life that is found in our baptism into Christ. For we ask all this then in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.